we pull into the campground. And as we pull in, there's a couple guys in the parking lot. I jump out of the truck. I'm like, hey, like, we got the other mower. Where's your mower? And uh guy kind of looks down, kind of, kind of, you know, a uh, little bit, a um, little sheepishly. He can He he points to the to the switchbacks, and we we look up to the switchbacks, and we can see the dust from the mower, and then we <laughs> hear this voice cry out from the buttes. <laughs> it says, "This guy, help! <laughs> I'm gonna lose it." And the next thing we know, Big Bertha is tumbling down the Wanigan switchbacks. It's like, twir- you know, pieces flying off everywhere. And I just like, I, I, I can't believe this is happening. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Stable Cyclist Podcast. My name is JP, and this week I have a very special guest on tap for you, a guy I consider a friend of mine. He is the man in charge of saving and maintaining the longest contiguous single track trail in the United States of America, the Matahe Trail. Nick Yabara is here to share tales from the Matahe Trail, from being race director of the Matahe 100 and the entire Badlands Race Series, and much, much more. And before we get started, I just want to continue to thank all of you who are listening all over the world. The messages I continue to get from people who listen are humbling, to say the least. Help us keep growing the pod by sharing it with others, or even, better yet, snap a screenshot while you listen and share it out on social media, out into the ether of the World Wide Web. If you do that, be sure to tag at the Stable Cyclist, as well as today's guest, at Matahe100. And it helps spread the love around. This episode is brought to you by Flow Formulas. If you are training for an upcoming race or you are just training to be a healthier person and you want to feel your best on the bike, then Flow Formulas Endurance Mix and Recovery Mix are for you. I am a very salty sweater. And for me, the high sodium mix that Flow Formulas puts out was an absolute game changer to my training when I started using it a year ago. You can use the code JohnPeter15 at checkout if you've got a cart full of goodies that you want to order, and that discount will knock a little bit off that price on your goodie cart. All right, enough of all that. It is time to get Nick Ybarra in the studio. Well, Nick Ybarra, welcome to the Stable Cyclist Podcast. It is, uh, it is great to see you. It is always really good to chat with you, man. Um, a lot of the people I have on this show are just people that I know you are a friend and so it is different to get a friend in here and just to hang out and and like I kind of told you ahead of time like sit here and have coffee with you but uh in a virtual sense instead of somewhere near the badlands so welcome man hey JP thanks for having me cheers brother coffee is good 100 percent and you are kind of in preparation mode as far as uh, race series goes as far as starting to get the trail maintenance crew organized for the year. What is what does April look like for you in the Badlands? And we're obviously going to get way more into what you do out there later in the in the conversation. But what does April look like for you? Yeah, man. Typically, April, I'm getting a lot of people texting me and asking, "Hey, what's the trail like?" and uh, you know, usually I I respond in saying, I'm not sure because I haven't been down there lately because I know it's soft and sloppy and muddy. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, and then it's me seeing on Facebook people posting, oh, I went out for a great hike on the Matahe this morning. The mud acted like ankle weights. It was such a good workout. <laughs> And I'm thinking that's gonna that's gonna be a lot of trail uh, that's gonna be a lot of trail work for us. And so um, I stay. I've learned to stay uh, really cool and calm about it because, dude, I used to be that trail user. I used to be the guy that was so excited to just get out and go have an adventure. Um, I had no I had um, no concept of the impact of going out on muddy trails doing it was doing trail damage and causing work for 
other people. It was just all about the exploration and adventure. And so I get it. Wherever you're at in your in your trail using journey, um, I, I just I respect that people got to get out and enjoy the trail. And then there's some people who are, we eventually get to the point where they're going to join us and come out and do trail maintenance and uh, and help give back at some point. And so, yeah, we're gearing up April. It's a lot of just like not really on the trail, um, but we always do. And we'll get into this more of this later. But with Save the Matahe in the middle of July every year, we do our big push to save the Matahe Trail where we go out with brush mowers and string trimmers and reclaim the trail. So in April, we've developed the big pole uh, where we bring some of our volunteers into base camp uh, where I'm at here in my office. We got a garage and a shop and we take all the mowers and string trimmers and do oil changes and uh, clean filters and get everything geared up, all of our equipment running smooth and ready so that when it's time to rock and roll, that stuff is good to go. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're going to dive a lot into your story. Obviously, we are going to get into the big push. We're going to get into the Matahe Trail and its allure and everything that comes with it. But you know, I'm a storyteller. And that's because I believe when we hear other people's stories, we get to see the bigger picture of why they make the decisions they make and why they're doing the things they do. And so I want to talk about how a kid from Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, ends up out in you know, Western North Dakota in the Badlands, falling in love with this place. Tell tell us a little bit of your story, Nick, about, you know, you, you did grow up in Bismarck, and then what was the, the path for you getting out to Western North Dakota eventually? Yeah. JP, I've seen every one of your podcast episodes, and you do such a good job. So I was ready for this question, the zero to hero question, right? Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I put a little thought into it, and I, I want to share – Mostly just the parts that involve cycling for me, um, but I'll, I'll throw in a couple extra little details just to give you a picture of how I got here. So I was born in a suburb of Houston, Texas. Um, my earliest memory there was getting my first bicycle for Christmas. And dude, I remember just being uh, so excited for that bicycle and trying to go out and first riding on training wheels. And then when my dad took the training wheels off, failing. And... Um, and I remember, you know, dad was at work, mom was working with me a little bit and we lived in a, a pretty rough neighborhood, you know, like, um, my, my dad's bicycle got stolen out of our garage in, in the middle of the day. And, you know, we were like, we were very, at that point, very low middle class, maybe almost poverty. Right. And, um, and I remember like it was time, Ma, my mom was a, a mother of three. Right. So we were really close together and, me, my brother, my sister, I'm the oldest. And, uh, you know, didn't work, didn't learn to ride my bike yet. We go inside for nap time and, uh, my mom passes out, you know, and, and my little brother, little sister, they're napping. And I'm sitting there thinking about that bicycle and wanting to ride without training wheels. And I get up and sneak out into the garage and, uh, the garage, it didn't have a, it wasn't power. So I like, I'm like five and I he man lift this garage door open enough <laughs> to slide my brand new white and green bicycle out underneath into the driveway. And then I shimmy underneath and I go out and use the slope of the driveway to jump on that bike and finally caught my groove and start rolling. And dude, that was my first taste of freedom. And that was, yes. I was like on the bike, I start pedaling. I go out and find the boys and we start, you know, like doing laps around the neighborhood. Mom wakes up, can't find me, you know, comes out pretty worried. But I'm, that was the beginning of my cycling addiction, right? So we moved from Houston to Bismarck, North Dakota in 1989. I was in kindergarten. Um, and uh, once in Bismarck, um, for some reason, we moved a lot. Uh, we just kept, you know, moving kind of. Every time we moved from one house to the next, we always seemed to change um, school districts. And so mm. I like forever felt like the new kid uh, almost everywhere I went. Um, and then uh, I really like the, the we actually moved back to Houston in my sophomore year. And uh, that was a super lonely time for me. Um, I spent a, I spent a half of my sophomore year in Texas and then. We moved back to Bismarck 
for my junior year. And I remember um, I didn't tell anyone I was coming back. And the like one of the best days of my life was was walking back into Century High School in Bismarck on like the second day of school, and no one knew I was coming. And it was it was like like this big reunion. And uh, and so man, that was awesome. And then um, I uh, I graduated. Um, I had, uh, you know, my junior year was, uh, nine 11. Um, and, uh, and so we had the, the terrorist attacks on the, on, on our country and, um, it moved me. I, I wanted to sign up for the military and I had some, I didn't know which branch, but I had a, a buddy that uh, was a little older than me and he signed up with the air national guard. And so when I was still in high school, um, I signed up to be an airman. And once I once I graduated, um, went off to basic training and and uh, learned how to be an F sixteen fighter jet engine mechanic. And uh, but while I was waiting after graduation, I was waiting to go to basic. Um, I was I was working on a roofing crew, and I had a buddy at church invite me uh, to go ride the Matahe Trail, and I I was like the the what. <laughs> You and didn't, you didn't said, understand the true spiritual experience you were going to go have with your church buddy. <laughs> exactly. And so he's like, dude, I'm stealing the church 15 passenger van. We're going to hook up a trailer and we're just, we're going out to the Matahe trail. And so, um, man, I threw my $150 Schwinn mountain bike that I bought at Walmart in the back of this trailer and loaded up with, uh, with a, with a band of young hooligans and, we we drove um, out to the Badlands, pulled into Magpie Campground at like midnight, set up a, set up my tent in the headlights, um, and then went to bed the next morning. Woke up in the Badlands, and the smell of sagebrush and juniper trees and uh, the the colors of the sunrise uh, reflecting off the buttes. It was just magical, and I made pancakes and eggs and bacon, and then. <laughs> loaded up on that Schwinn and everybody kind of trickled out. Everybody, you know, like headed out on their own and uh, I went south and every everyone got oh split up and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, I like, I'm all, all alone and I come around the corner and I see Devil's Pass and it's still to this day my favorite spot on the whole 180 mile Matahe trail system and uh, dude, it's it was where, like Teddy Roosevelt says, it it was where the romance of my life began. And I fell head over heels in love with the Badlands, uh, with mountain biking as a form of exploration and adventure, and, uh, and then went off to basic training. Um, you know, spent some time away, and it was like the more that I was away, the more I thought about the Badlands and the Matahe Trail and how I wanted to get back there and ride. And then I went to went to went to college in Minneapolis and was just like telling all my college buddies about the Matahe Trail and we'd be biking local trails around Minneapolis. But then it was like whenever I had a chance, I was bringing those guys back to North Dakota to mountain bike the Matahe, and it just it would just it blew everyone's mind, right? It's just such a special trail, and like you said, it's it's like it's a very spiritual trail. So that's like. And then the rest, that's, that's become my whole life, man. Like I just, my whole life now is my mission is to, is to save and share that trail with as many people as possible. So you, did it happen in college or after college where you decided you were going to try and ride the whole thing in a day? Um, so I fell in love with it. And then in, I uh, made the goal. So in college, I heard stories uh, about these these legends. And the Mata Hay Trail is a pretty new trail system. It opened in 1999, and so I'm in I'm in school. It's by this point, it's like 2004 through 2008 when I'm in school in Minneapolis, and I hear stories of these guys who rolled the whole trail end to end in in one day, starting in the dark, finishing in the dark, and I made it a goal. And so came back in, in, once in college and rode it in three days with a couple friends. And then there was a couple times where we came back to attempt it. And uh, the, 
that's when I used to be that trail ride, that kind of trail user where we're, <laughs> we travel all the way home and it's wet. And, and the, the local guy that I um, wrangled into being our SAG driver, he was like, you guys can't do it. Like, you're not going to make it. It's the, the Badlands are wet right now. And, you know, just yeah. being young and dumb, we're like, oh, no. Like, I think we can make it. <laughs> and, uh, and leaving Triple C and having it take, you know, five hours to get to the, to the, the 10 mile mark where you cross the gravel road <laughs> and being like, yeah, we're, we're not going to make it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, made it a goal. It, it wasn't until, um, I moved back to North Dakota, um, it, for, for my, uh, after school for my career, um, that it, it was in 2009 when I finally, you know, accomplished my goal to ride the whole trail in one day. And, and for some context, some people might be thinking like that you're talking about 150, the, the deuce didn't exist yet at that point. And so you're talking the, the original hundred. Yeah. Correct? Yep. The original, you know, the trail originally was 97 miles long because the, the actual Madahe trail goes through, um, both of the units of the Theodore Roosevelt national park, which are designated wilderness. So bicycles aren't allowed through either unit of the park. The southern unit has the bypass trail, the Buffalo Gap Trail. Um, so, you know, the 97 mile end to end point to point trip for a hiker becomes about 107 for a mountain biker, uh, with the bypass trail. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was about a 106, 100 mile, 107 mile trip from CCC campground at the northernmost point of the trail, um, down to Sully Creek campground, um, that first time that I rode the whole trail. So I believe a lot of people just don't know the background of this trail uh, and how it how it got put together. Um, I talked in the podcast that will actually come out last week uh, with Aaron Haugen, the DP on the on the film that we did. There's a lot of information we just couldn't include in the film. And like we cut like a half an hour of information where like Uncle Phil is talking a ton about the history and what use like how it used to be all these just hunting routes and animal routes that people would follow into there and kind of how did the Madahe come about as being developed who like are there people that were really important that we would be familiar with today or was it 100% forest service decision or how did this amazing long single track trail land in the badlands yeah so the story that i know um is talking with the local rancher who's passed away now, um, but his name's Morris Torna Tarnowski. Tarnowski, if I'm saying that correctly. And uh, I used to run into him around Triple C Campground. Uh, and one time we got to talking about the trail, and he was a horseback rider and a rancher and a really cool cowboy kind of guy. And he said that, you know, that area before Triple C Campground was a campground, his buddies used to bring horse trailers out and they would just all just disperse camp right there. And, uh, and they would go out and do just horseback rides for the weekend and just, just go, just be in the Badlands, um, camp, hang out and have a good time. And he told me that he approached the forest service with an idea of doing a horse packing trip, connecting the North unit of the Roosevelt national park to the South unit. And, uh, you know, that would be about that 97 mile journey through the Badlands. And the Forest Service took that idea and decided, let's, let's make it an actual single track trail. And I, that is the origin story of the Madahe that I know. And I think if you were to talk to people at the MHA, um, uh, on the reservation, um, the, uh, Mandan Hidatsa Rikara, tribes affiliated tribes you know i think you would hear stories uh deeper history that you know that that the madahe corridor was once a, a a travel route for native americans and you know i think that that could definitely be true and when the trail was built a lot of it just followed cattle trail 
right? Like you've yeah. got the history of the Long X Trail, people driving cattle from Texas up to North Dakota. Um, and so there's a, there's a ton of history there. Um, but that's the, that's the story that I know of why the Matahe even became an idea. Sure. So this trail exists, you knock out Matahe in a day, uh, and it's one of those like, you know, life altering moments for you. And again, you're riding on a pretty, uh, low grade bike by today's standards, but you got it done. At what point does save the Matahe come into the picture because it's and 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 this is where I want to help people understand and maybe I don't even understand the right order here is the race first and and then they save the Matahe or does the trail need to be saved first and then you have the race like kind of help us put these things in order dude yes it <laughs> is like what came first <laughs> um yeah so, 2009, I ride the whole trail in one day, and it changes me from the outside in to the inside out. I have I have no idea what endurance is, right? Like, I go out, and this is 100% an adventure. And, you know, I hit that wall where it's like, I don't know if, uh, if I'm going to make it or not. And my buddy, um, Chad Zemendorf, is sagging us. Uh, my buddy uh, Chad Bergen is riding some of the some of the trail with me, and it's like Chad got uh, you know some some video footage of me like at that point you know where you are on the edge and you don't think you can ride one more mile, but somehow you get back on the bike and you do it, and and when I did it that it became the hardest thing that I had ever done in my life that I overcame and. and and prove to myself that I had what it took to do it. And and at that point, I decided that I wanted to share that experience with as many people as possible. And that's where I, I started thinking like, okay, there are these long mountain bike races uh, all around the country. When I was in school, my when I was in college, my buddy and I, we went down to Leadville and we did the Silver Rush 50. And that was my first long race. I, I had done some of the Minnesota State Championship Series races around Minnesota, and that's where I like really learned how how, how not good of a mountain biker I was. Um, <laughs> and then I went to Leadville, and then you know you go from 800 feet uh, elevation in Minneapolis to Leadville, starting at 10,000 feet, and it was like you just like you just learn um, the level of com- competition that's out there. How how incredible! these the pro mountain bikes bikers really are and so i was like okay i want i want more people to be able to like experience the monahe trail how does this how does this trail compare to the leadville 100 how does it compare to these other really cool races and i went back in uh 2010 to ride the trail again invited my friend ian easton and we went out there and my parents sagged us and my goal was to beat my record time from the year before which was 20 hours um and i was like all right we want to i want to beat that time and we head out and we have all kinds of it's an adventure like we had bike mechanical breakdowns we were we were getting lost on the trail every time you hit a fork on in the badlands single track it's like sometimes the Madahe trail goes this way and you can't quite see the next mile marker post yet but all the cattle have been going down this trail to get to water. And so it looks like the more established trail. And so we got lost so many times, had to turn around, come back, go. And we end up, and then, you know, light failures in the dark. And we end up beating the previous year's time by two minutes. (laughs) And, uh, and, but it was like, okay, like I I told my dad, like, I want to make this an actual race. And he looked at me and he said, Nick, people will die. <laughs> there is, there, there is, you can't invite people out here to, to do this as a, as a race, as a thing. And uh, I talked to my wife, Lindsay, and we started brainstorming about how we could do it. And we made plans to launch it in 2011. And, you know, the trail up to that point had had, um, forest service crews, summer crews that would come out and do trail maintenance. Um, and 
and they would have these crews of like 15 people that would come and, and work on the trail in the summer and then um, go uh, just part-time employees. And then the Forest Service lost funding and staffing for trail maintenance. Well, it kind of became this perfect storm of events where uh, those prior years were pretty dry years in North Dakota, uh, maybe even you know actual drought years, a couple of them. Then all of a sudden, like 2010, 11, 12 in North Dakota, we start getting those winters where we just got dumped on feet of snow and uh, and wet springs. And I remember driving uh, through the Badlands and seeing the buttes. Um, they looked like it. There was it. There was mud actively flowing down the butte. <laughs> right, like it was like it. It was stuff was eroding, moving, landslides, slumps. It was like um, not only was the trail getting damaged with, uh, with, with the actual land moving and slumping, um, but also then it was like all that dry desert prairie vegetation that had just been like waiting for this just took off and exploded. And, it, and the trail became this like jungle of robust um, vegetation. And so, you know, all that happened in the same, so 2011, the trails really starting to like get overgrown. And there were sections where I would go out to ride and sections that I knew pretty well, I was getting lost on. And it was like, I couldn't actually find the trail. And then by the time, you know, um, there was a couple times where it was like, it, the, I sent you a picture where it yep. was so thick, right? That I'm standing, I'm standing over my Trek fuel mountain bike and, and the vegetation, I don't know what it's called, but it's not grass. It was like, it's like buck brush. Um, and I'll have to learn what it is, but it's handlebar high. And I'm standing, straddling my bike one foot on each side of the Matahe trail. And you can't see the next post. And it is just a sea of this handlebar high vegetation. And I actually couldn't even ride my bike. I had to shoulder my bike and bushwhack. And it was, I took, that was the day that I decided we, we have to save the Matahe Trail. And so the, what came first, the idea for the race or save the Matahe, it was, it was, um, 2012 was the inaugural year of the Matahe 100. And that was the year that, um, that, you know, we, it was when I first started working at the Forest Service to get special use permits to host a, an event and learning that whole process. Um, and then asking them, who's it, who's in charge of doing trail maintenance? And like, well, it's us, but we're underfunded, right? Um, and, and so it was like, well, how can we get the trail in at least good enough shape for, for these mountain bikers to find their way down the trail? And it was like the Forest Service took their, you know, their, their skeleton crew. And I would, and they were like, do you know the, they asked me if I knew the worst sections. And so I kind of give them a checklist of like, you got to hit this section. You got to hit this section. And they went out with their brush mowers and tried to do as much as they could. And I remember going out there to try and mark the course and, and prep and being actually pretty surprised at how they got mowers out to these sections of trail that were hard to even, even hike to. And, uh, and so, you know, like they did, they did what they could. We have the inaugural Matahe 100. It's a free event. I'm going to grab this dude. This is the first, uh, this is the first, um, Matahe 100 poster. And so this is nice. like, it's, it's, uh, it's a free event. And, and we just invited mountain bikers to come out and experience the Matahe Trail. And I think it hit a mountain bike forum. And race day, 60, 60 people show up the night before for wow. the pre-race meeting from all over the country, you know. And uh, people I don't know. And it's like, it, it, was, like, uh, it was like my people, right? Yeah. It was like all of a sudden there's mountain bikers in this town of 1,200 people um, in western North Dakota, Watford City. And they're all here to ride the Matahe Trail. And so we take them, I take them down to CCC Campground and tell them, you know, we'll, we'll see you guys in Medora on your marks, get set, <laughs> go. <laughs> and dude, every single person got lost. Every single person. 
And, um, and, and it was, it was after that, that it was the next year. Um, it was like, okay, if we're going to do this again, we've got to make that better. We've got to improve. And I asked the forest service for permission to help with trail maintenance. And I asked them if I could, if I could go out and try to mow the trail and hit those sections where they weren't able to get it all. And the trail manager, you know, he was really kind of hesitant, very reluctant, but also like I could see half of his face was like really relieved. And he was like, we, like, okay, like, we'll let you go out and see what you can get done. And I don't think that they had very high expectations for us. Um, you know, he, he'd been out there with a brush mower. He knew what we were getting into. And I remember like, um, I went to race to sunset, which was a 10 hour, uh, lap race on a four mile mountain bike course in Bismarck. And that's where I first met Kelly McGelkey with that race to sunset. Yep. And, uh, it was after the race and we were just having awards and beers. And, uh, and I like, I said, look, I, <laughs> they gave me the microphone and I was like, <laughs> I really, I really think that the the Matahe 100 can be something, but the trail is disappearing, and if we don't save it, nobody else is going to. And uh, Lindsay was sitting in the back row, and I remember, you know, she like saw some people's reactions, and some people were kind of snickering and thinking, like, you know, there's no way, like, you guys are are gonna do this. And uh, there was a handful of guys in that crowd that got a hold of me afterwards and said, "We're we're with you. Like, we're going to do this." And one of them was Easton, one of them was Brian Freed, and the other one was Chad Bergen. And uh, they they borrowed two brush mowers, and we got a hold of a couple string trimmers, and they came out, and we had no idea what we were getting into, and <laughs> we headed out. For a 10 mile point to point, uh, we went from basically where you access uh, China Wall, um, yep. where it's it, it's a private road and you get in there and you got 10 mile stretch until you get to County Road uh, 50, Bicycle Creek Road. And we picked this 10 mile stretch of just absolute, it, it was part of the section where I was standing there over my bike and it's handlebar high and you can't see the trail. And we took two brush mowers and they went side by side down the trail. And then we follow the string trimmers and we just like, it wasn't just trail maintenance. It was trail. Uh, it was reclaiming, yeah. remaking trail. And that's dude. And that's, and that's how Stave the Matahe was born. It was born with two borrowed brush mowers and, and a few dedicated people. Yeah. So that, that was my question, Nick is, I'm always fascinated when I can talk to people like yourself who have taken a idea, an impossible idea, and you've gotten it to the point where like, no, this is what we do. Like people just know this is what we do. And, and now we do, we have this relationship with forest service and we do these things who were obviously Lindsay, your wife was huge in being a sounding board for you. And probably if she's like my wife kept a lot of your dumb ideas from ever getting outside of your house. But besides her, who were the people like really close to you that were your sounding boards and really helped you suss out what you needed to make happen to have us to make this a success? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Um, Brian Freed, he, he is the one that like, he does a lot of the mowing around the trails, his local trails in Bismarck. And he like showed me how to use his, it was his club brush mower. Um, it was a little green billy goat and he, he brought it out and he said, you know, after that first day he's like, well, we got 10 miles done. We got 90 to go. And he's like, I, I'll leave you this mower if, if you want to use it. And I said, yeah, I, I'll, I'll keep going. And then it was um, Chad Bergen. He came out a couple more times that year, made trips from Bismarck, and came out and and, and mowed with me. And uh, and we were taking, uh, we were just taking off these bite-sized chunks of the trail, just like one one day at a time when we could get out there. And then it was the the next guy that has become like a pretty much a father figure to me. 
I call him my adopted uncle. And that's yeah. Phil Helfrich. And uh dude, I'll like if I told you all the Uncle Phil stories, like I would I would just I'd be pretty emotional by the end of it. Um but the first time I saw Uncle Phil, I was riding my mountain bike near Wanigan and all I was all alone and I was going up some switchbacks and there's this guy coming down the trail on a horse and and he's got a he's got a machete in his hand. He's got one of these. Um, <laughs> he's got he's got this. He calls it his shellacker. So he's got this in his hand, and he's he's lopping branches as he's riding his horse down the trail. And usually, you know, the as um, as the rules of the trail etiquette. Um, Bikes yield to hikers and bikes yield to horses. And so, you know, like I'm huffing and puffing tunnel vision. I want this climb. I want to clean this climb. And I'm like, I'm ready to, once I get to him, I'm ready to pull off the side of the trail to let this horseman go by. And he was the first horseman that I ever met on the Madhe that pulls off to the side for me and smiles. And he's like, come on through, you know? And it was like, I kind of recognized him. I was kind of wondering why he was smiling so big at me and, and I was like, you know, like I'm, I'm just like in the zone and I just keep going. And then it, um, that was the first time I remember ever seeing Phil. The second time was actually, now that I think about it, very close to that spot. And I had Brian Freed's Billy Goat mower and Uncle Phil had heard, you know, talked to Brian Freed and Chad Bergen back in Bismarck, figured, you know, figured out what was what the plan was for the trail. We were just chipping away at it slowly. And he took that other brush mower, borrowed it from the guys at Harmon Lake, um, and, and, and stole that brush mower and came out and wanted to, to mow more trail than Nick Yabara could mow that first year. And that was kind of his, like, that was kind of his motivating factor. He was like, yeah, I love the Matahe Trail too. And he is, and I want to, I want to save it. And I'm going to mow more than Nick mows. And so he was out there mowing. And uh, and it was like the time that we actually met, um, his mower broke down, needed a part. And he asked if he could take a part off of one of my mowers. I think by that point, I had borrowed a brush mower from the Forest Service. And so we had two DR brush mowers. And I met him at one again. And we took, we took a part off of mine, put it on his. And it was like this moment of like, I just like, it was this bonding. Like we had a mission, we had a plan, we were working together. We were both doing it solo um, most of the time. But then it was like, it was like we met and it was like, we just instantly, it was like more than a friendship. It was a bond. Yeah, that's amazing. Plus you probably thought he lived just out in like the, the woods of Wanigan by then with the encounters right. you had had with him. Yeah. <laughs> tell tell us about what you've hinted at the big push. Obviously at some point it's no longer just you and Phil racing each other from opposite ends trying to get this done. It becomes uh it becomes a nonprofit organization. It becomes a very um you know, well-oiled machine with a plan of how we're going to do this in a time and you get a bunch of people out there. What, what is the big push and when did that really come into play? Because I think that's, you know, really with, we talk about well, Mata Hayes, the longest contiguous single track in the U S um, that's what makes it so unique as a race. It is single track basically from start to finish, but you're the guy keeping it going and this organization is keeping it going. At what point does it become more than you and just uncle Phil in a manly man contest out there? Yeah. So 2014, um, I go out to try and, and ride the Madahe in a day with my buddy, Chris Knoll. And we're going out. It's like the, towards the end of June and, and we take off and it's like, you know, 2000, 2013, it was like, we, it was the first year, the entire Matahe trail at that point, it was the, you know, 107 miles. It was the first year that the whole trail ever got mowed in one year. And then I'm thinking like, dude, like we did it. We saved the trail. We brought like that, all that vegetation now is cleared back. Like we're good to go. 
and uh, and I we go out to to ride the trail in a day, and we start hitting these sections where it's only June, and and some of the trail is thicker and hairier than the than the worst stuff the year before, and I and I remember looking at Chris and and saying, dude, I can't do that again, like. What we did last year, like we did the impossible. It was like David versus Goliath, but yeah. we, I can't fight Goliath again this year. Like the sacrifices and the toll and like what that took on, on, on a family and on my leisure time and my, and you know, like my goal at that point, I still, I wanted to be like a Kelly McGelkey, right? Like I wanted to try and, and get to like expert level mountain biking. And it was like, we were just saving the only trail that we had. And so then 2014, we go out and, and I realized we're going to have to do that again. It was really heartbreaking. And so we, uh, dude, we ponied up and, and we did it again. And it was like, it's like every year, you know, whether you want to say, uh, if you if you have faith in God and you want to say God sends people or you know, f- fable stories like the alchemist, where if you believe like when you're chasing your personal legend, like the, the people come to support, uh, like I, every year God sent me like at least one solid guy that would, yeah. that helped me get through that year. Um, and, and, and it's become multiple people over the years. And, uh, and so dude, we started in 2013 and and we've voluntarily um, reclaimed and and mowed and stream trimmed and saved the Mata Hay Trail every year, every annual year. And so we, everything we've done has been just on the job training. Uh, we knew I knew nothing when I started, and now uh, we are the best in the world <laughs> at uh, at maintaining the Mata Hay Trail, and and we. Uh, we grew it from, uh, from you know, two borrowed brush mowers to now we're an official five hundred one c three nonprofit. Yeah, so let's talk logistics specifically of the big push. When is it? Who can come and help you? And what are the what are the kind of parameters? Yeah. Yep. So. We've learned so much since 2013. So, um, you know, it used to take us that year. We started in June and we wanted to have the trail ready by the Madahe 100 in August. And so it was like this two month process of, you know, start to finish mowing 107 miles of single track, which means you're pushing mowers um, 214 miles, right? Because you can only mow one side of the trail at a time. And so, you know, we we learned, we evolved um, from going doing these point to point missions um, to starting to do out and backs. You know, and that was just by necessity because most of the time it, it was just one guy with a mower, and you would drive out to a uh, uh, campground, a trailhead, or a road intersection, and you would take off with a mower and go about seven miles out, turn around, and come seven miles back. And so now we have. Uh, you know, we've perfected the big push into this 10 day window where we invite volunteers to come out and meet us in the Badlands. And we say, you know, we're starting on the, at the North end at triple C and we're just going to mow South. And we go out and we do whoever shows up. Um, we mow as much as we can in, in that day. And you never really know how far you're going to get in a day. And then we just announce, all right, uh, tomorrow morning, we're meeting at this trailhead. If you want to help out, meet us at sunrise and we see who shows up and then we get them on mowers, string trimmers, um, and go out there and we do the next stretch for the day. And we've actually been able to, to get the whole thing done, uh, in just this 10 day window, two weekends and, and one week. And last year, 2023, we actually did the entire 150 miles, right? So usually big push we focus on uh, 107 um for the for the big races and then we'll, we'll go out and try and chip away at the at the southern 50 last year we it was so efficient weather was so perfect volunteers showed up um and we just like we knocked out the whole 150 miles plus the connecting trails at cottonwood 
um, Bennett Trail, um, and those other, you know, some of those Long X Trail, some of those loops. Uh, we did the whole 180 mile trail system, except what's in the national parks in 10 days. That's amazing. What, how much experience does somebody need to have in trail work to come and help you guys do your job? Dude, uh, any, we'll take anybody. We do <laughs> not discriminate. <laughs> uh, we've got the guys that come out and, uh, and you know, they call them our operators. They're the guys that we trust with mowers. Um, and then, uh, we've got our people that have never done a day of trail work in their life. And, you know, it's like you just come out and whatever you're comfortable doing, um, if all it is is just, you know, taking a hand pruner and cutting back branches, um, you take a handsaw, you cut the bigger branches, you want to shovel a little dirt, um, go out with the mower. By far, the absolute hardest job is string trimming. Um, we call our string trimmers our tail gunners. And so you've got the brush mower. It does one side of the trail on the way out and then... It can't get down in that trail bed. So much of the matahe is kind of cupped or bold, um, and, and the mower can't get down in that stuff. And we, the matahe trail doesn't have a, as much traffic as other places like, say, like Glacier National Park or, or some of these really high trafficked trails where it's just like it's trail users that keep the trail bed um, worn in. Um, matahe, it's like we have to fight to keep that trail bed. And so string trimmers come behind the mowers and they buzz in that actual trail bed where grass is starting to grow in, where there's light, not a lot of foot traffic. And so um, that job is where you're, you're holding a string trimmer and you've got it, your head down and it's like, and, and the string trimmer head in the dirt all day. And you're just like peppering your legs with rocks. And then you start to get like tennis elbow because you're trying to, to tweak that, you know, have just the right angle where the, where the string trimmer is doing its job and you're just hiking all day, you know, with, with this, with this machine in your hand. Um, and so that's, that is the hardest job. Um, and so we, it takes everybody, you know, like yeah. uncle Phil and I will average, a uh, at least a half marathon a day, um, pushing a brush mower. And then like, so someone comes out and they're like, well, I can, I'm here for a day. And we're like, all right, you're a string trimmer because there's no way that uncle Phil and I could run string trimmers for 10 days straight. Like yeah. we're, it's no easy job pushing the brush mower, but once you learn to dance with it, um, and you know, that's a sustainable job. I can push a brush mower for 10 days back to back to back. Um, but we'll, we'll use these, the volunteers that come out. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of divvy out the jobs as, as you know, their, their level of, fitness, um, and ambition and, com and conditions allow. So we'll sure. take everyone, man. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people get worried when they see the big push and they see the promotional videos of what you guys are doing. They're like, well, I've never done trail work and I definitely don't want to drive a brush mower in the badlands. Cause it, you know, when you're up on the bluff, it looks pretty easy when you're trying to swing it around a switchback, uh, you know, North of, uh, north of China wall, it's pretty hairy. And yeah. I guess that leads me to my next question. Nobody knew is going to have to do that, but I have heard a really epic story about what happened when a new person did try to run a brush more one time near Wanigan. Yeah. And I think everybody would love to hear that story. <laughs> Dude. So, you know, the book Alexander's no good, terrible, bad day. Um, the, <laughs> this, this is, this is the absolute worst day of trail work that we've ever had to date. And, um, yeah, man, it was just another one of those perfect storm of events where we, I had a crew of newbies that were coming that were willing to, it was a, it was a guy that has his own business and he was going to, he offered to bring his crew out, take the day off of work. And he, he brought his employees out to help with trail maintenance, which is awesome right like we needed the help um this was this was 2014 this is towards the end like we're pretty far south and like we're just like we're almost done and uh we had one mower that was broken down um it was getting fixed up we thought it was going to be fixed um by this day and so we all meet in medora and i get to medora that morning and the mower's not fixed yet so uh easton 
um, Lauren Morlock from Dakota Cyclery and I are working on fixing this mower and it's a, it's a big job, right? It's a big fix. And then the, the, the Dickinson crew pulls in and, uh, they're like ready to go and they, they have a time limit. And so I'm like, I've got this giant, we call her Big Bertha. I got this, this giant brush mower, uh, forest service mower in the back of my truck. And that's the one I plan on taking out with Easton. <laughs> the one we're fixing is smaller, you know, a little bit more manageable. And I, it was the one I wanted to send with the newbies. And so, yeah. you know, I asked him, uh, like, are you guys mechanical at all? Like, does this look like a job? Like, could you put this smaller mower back together and then take this one to Juan again? And he's like, no, nah, I don't feel comfortable doing that. He's like, why don't you just give me that mower in the back of your truck? And I'm like, dude, my gut is telling me, don't send Big Bertha. Do like, don't do it. And I'm just sitting there, like, like rolling through the scenarios in my mind. And I'm like, oh, these guys came all the way from Dickinson. They're here. They want to work. They have to be back in Dickinson this afternoon. Like, all right. And I just like, I'm just like, I just, I got to make a decision. And so I decide to send Big Bertha with the Dickinson crew. And I said, go to Juan again, mow south. And then, like, whatever you do, do not do not take Big Bertha up the switchbacks. Do not <laughs> take this mower up the Juan again switchbacks. Okay? So Dickinson crew rolls well, out. And, and we uh, got to add some context that, like, the Juan again switchbacks feel – they're incredibly high, and they feel, like, as sketchy as anything on the Matahe Trail. So exposed. Because they're just so exposed. So tight. Yep, yeah, such narrow trail, right? Like so <laughs> narrow. And then like, uh, uh, yeah, and the consequence of failure is so high. <laughs> and so anyways, we, we, we slap this broken mower back together. We get it running. It's ready to go. Easton and I loaded in my truck and we blast out to Juan again and we're going to swap <laughs> mowers, right? We're going to take back Big Bertha and, uh, and give them the small one to go out and do another section of trail. We pull into the campground. And as we pull in, there's a couple guys in the parking lot. I jump out of the truck. I'm like, hey, like, we got the other mower. Where's your mower? And uh guy kind of looks down, kind of, kind of, you know, a uh, little bit, a um, little sheepishly. He, he, he points to the, to the switchbacks. And we, we look up to the switchbacks and we can see the dust from the mower. And then we hear this voice cry out from the buttes. <laughs> it says, this guy, help, <laughs> I'm going to lose it. And the next thing we know, Big Bertha is tumbling down the Wanigan switchback. It's like, twir you know, pieces flying off everywhere. And I just like, I, I, I can't believe this is happening. And so, <sighs> We get the mower, we get it back to the camp, we swap, we swap mowers. Um, Easton and I start fixing Big Bertha, and we tell Dickinson crew, go to the next road crossing and, and mow to, you know, these, this is what's been mowed. If you can mow to the old mile marker 22, now the mile markers have changed. But if you can mow to the old mile marker 22, there's some old wooden switchbacks there. It's the only section, it's the only part on the trail that has wooden switchbacks. Um, I'm like, there's a little dirt work that needs to be done there. And then, you know, like that only leaves this tiny section of trail left for tomorrow. Um, Cause then what Issa and I will get done today, I'll come back and finish tomorrow. We send out Dickinson, they go out, they mow, they go home to Dickinson. Issa and I, we go out and mow our big section. We did like, you know, we took a, a big chunk that day with Big Bertha. We get back to the trunk, truck and we're at the road crossing where it's only like two miles to go to get to mile marker 22. And we've got Big Bertha and we're, we're exhausted from that day's work and it's not quite sunset. We've got a few hours before sunset and I looked at him and I'm like, dude, do you want to just like, can we just finish this up today? And he goes, yeah, let's go for it. And so we take off with Big Bertha and we head south uh, to go meet their mowing at mile marker 22. We get to mile marker 22 and there's no sign of their mowing. And so we call and I'm like, hey, like, did you guys, like, how far did you get? And he's like, well, I'm, I think we got there. I'm not quite sure. I'm like, well, no, you, you didn't get there. 
Like, is because we're here. I was like, did you do any? Did you do any? Like, did you have to do some dirt work? He's like, well, yeah, we did some dirt work, dude. So East and I were we're doing dirt work. We're we're mowing. We're doing more dirt work, and it's like the sun has set, and we have not found their mowing yet. And the sun goes down. It's dark. Big Bertha is shooting flames out of where the muffler used to be. And we're just like, I'm just like hauling down the trail. Easton's following with the string trimmer. Finally, dude, by moonlight, we find where the Dickinson crew left off. And we meet up with their mowing. We turn around to go out. And it's like, there, there's there's so much more to the whole story. We, we had stopped for a dirt dig. and uh, And it was like, you know, I, I'm hearing these sounds in the bushes and usually like you hear a big sound and it's a small animal, right? Like it's, it's a bird or a squirrel rustling in the leaves and it sounds like something like big and scary, but it's just this tiny little thing. Um, and it's like the bigger the animal, the, the quieter they are, the stealthier they are. But the thing is like mule deer, there's a lot of mule deer in the badlands. Um, they're super stealthy. Uh, but once they know you're close, they get spooked. And they, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll blow their nose um, and then they'll hop off and you can hear it. It's a very distinct sound. Even if you can't see them, you know, it's a mule deer by the way they hop. And, uh, yeah. and it, so I'm hearing these, we're digging and I'm hearing these really small, stealthy noises in, in the bushes. And I'm like, it's not a small animal and it's not a mule deer. I'm like, Easton. I think there's a mountain lion. <laughs> yeah, there's not many uh, animals left that you can pick from. I'm like, I'm like, I think that this is a mountain lion. And I, I'd been coyote hunting with a friend, and we had, you know, we had we had called for coyotes, and I, I've heard similar noises, and never seen a coyote, never saw a mountain lion. But then when we packed up our gear from calling and went to hike out on the trail, there's fresh mountain lion tracks over the top of our boot tracks, <laughs> right? Never saw it, didn't know, you know, like, but heard these tiny, and I'm like, dude, call me crazy, but I think there's a mountain lion in these bushes. And so we like, okay, so it turns into we're pushing Big Bertha through the Badlands in the dark, and I I hand off my uh, 38 special uh, handgun to Easton. He's got my (laughs) handgun in one hand. He's got a flashlight in the other hand. And he's, like, trying to shine light for me to push the mower. And at the same time, like, scanning, looking for this this mountain lion that's hunting us. And, dude, it's like just when you think it can't get any worse, we get to Crooked Creek. And I'm I'm going down to to Crooked Creek with Big Bertha. And it's like there's just dust swirling everywhere and the light from the flashlight it's like it's like when you're trying to drive through really thick fog and all you see is your headlights hitting that cloud of fog and that's what it's like and i'm like going blindly down into this creek and all of a sudden big birth that drops off into the creek and oh, those old dr brush mowers they uh you could lock the differential so it was like they're two wheel walk behind mowers but this, when you lock the differential, it's like having it in four wheel drive. And this heavy mower drops into the creek, and the tires came off of the trail, and they're spinning in you know full speed fourth gear. And and all of a sudden, as I'm trying to fight the mower through, the wheels catch traction, and my hands are like grip locked to the handlebars of that mower. And when the wheels caught, it pulled the mower down into the creek. And I couldn't let go, and it it pulled my back out. Um, and so now I'm in the bottom of Crooked Creek with the mower, with a broken back, and it and we have a little over a mile to get back to the truck. And dude, it was like it was the most painful mile. We get out, we get to the truck, and I just dropped the tailgate. I took a handful of Advil and I cracked open two PBRs and I just chugged these two PBRs <laughs> and laid on my tailgate and thought that like, this is, what are we doing out here? This is the worst day of my life. <laughs> that is incredible. I didn't realize I had heard separately the mountain lion story and the brush more story. I did not realize they were all in the same day. That is incredible. Mm-hmm the most awful, terrible, bad day of trail maintenance we've ever had. So you do save the Matahe 
people think of big push, that's it. But you are doing a lot more than that. We had conversations throughout the fall. You're going to Washington, D.C., and you're working with the forest. The for, obviously, you're working with the Forest Service. You're working with the National Park Service. You're working with Congress now on things. What kinds of work is Save the Matahe doing outside of just taking care of that beautiful trail? Yeah, dude. Okay, so um, 2023, I, I finally became – we've grown our organization – from starting with two borrowed brush mowers um, to now ha- being a 501c3 nonprofit, to having a board of directors, and now and our next our next level up as we've slowly you know done all of our own fundraising and um, and and gotten this support. Now I'm finally the official director of Save the Matahe. and what that's allowed me to do is now we're getting involved um, with advocating for the trail. And so, you know, the Matahe, I truly, so Matahe means something that has been or will be around for a long time, like a grandfather. And that's a Native American term from the Mandan um, tribe. Uh, and, and that and that can mean something. Grandfather isn't just biological in that sense. Um, right. It's a, it's a picture language. And so grandfather means like something that teaches you. And so it can be a person like Uncle Phil would be like a Matahe, right? Um, The trail out there could be considered like a Matahe. You know, when you're out there and you stop and you just listen and you like you reconnect with that side of your soul and and have that spiritual experience and and you learn when you're out there in the Badlands, that's Matahe. And so... You know, that trail has so much significance and meaning, but if we had never started volunteering to help maintain it, I don't know if it would have lived up to its name. And so what our organization started as is just like hands-on grunt work, just like sheer determination to keep this trail from going extinct. That's what we started as. And now we're working towards advocating and getting involved with the with the actual decision-making processes where these people um, that are that are high up in, in the offices that make decisions that affect the North Dakota Badlands and that affect the Matahe Trail, you know, we want to be involved in that process. And so um, I was invited by uh, IMBA to go down for this Washington, D.C. fly-in um, where I got to go and be a part of the process of going and and uh, advocating um, to our to our representatives, our congressmen, um, uh, for mountain biking. And for me, you know, I said I would only be willing to come down if I could specifically focus on uh, our situation with the Matahe Trail. And and right now, you know, like the highest majority user group of the trail of the three um, multi-use uh, users for our trail system. Um, it, you know, we have hikers, uh, bikers and riders, we have horse horses on our trail and by far, you know, the majority users, mountain bikers. And right now, the only thing stopping a mountain biker from going point to point on the whole trail system is there's no bypass trail to get around the North unit of the Theodore Roosevelt national park. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know if you're going to show up, if you can pop up a picture of the map, but there's this little tiny 1.7 mile stretch of trail that goes through the very um, southern, most southeastern corner of the north unit of the national park um, that is wilderness area and bicycles can't go through there. And then it's it's surrounded by forest service land and then it's landlocked by a piece of private property. And so there's no bypass trail around the park and that's the only thing that stops mountain bikers from being able to go end to end on the whole trail and so we're trying to find a solution to the north unit problem and so that has that we're looking at multiple options for how can we how can we solve that problem and we've got three good options one is building a bypass trail that means we're working with forest service and private property owners Um, we think that another solution uh, is to um, get you know there are 
there's a road. There's roads that go through the Theodore Roosevelt National Park through the wilderness area. So there's corridors there where the you know the 1964 Wilderness Act. Um, there's uh, there's an easement for people to drive vehicles through the park through the wilderness. Uh, you know why can't there be a corridor for an easement for bicycles to go through this 1.7 mile stretch of trail in the park? Yeah. It, it it wouldn't impact. Um, it wouldn't impact the wilderness in any negative way. Um, and then, you know, another option is it, it, another thing that would take an act of Congress, like that last option, would be um, moving the boundary of the wilderness area just enough mm. so that we get the trail out of the wilderness area and do some kind of, you know, um, there's land swaps that happen all the time between federal property, private landowners, two different federal um, property managers. So yeah. there is there's options, and now Save the Mata has become a, an organization that is working towards, um, you know, making those kind of impacts on the trail that affects all trail users in a positive way. Awesome. Let's shift, and we've been talking about the trail. We've been talking about your work to to save it. I want to get more into the race itself. You obviously have the, the Badlands Race Series, which is a lot of different events that have grown out of the original Matahe 100. But I want to talk specifically about Matahe 100 because I think that's where you and I have done most of our uh, work together, if you want to call it that, and our future work together. And uh, Let's talk through the early years of this race growth. You said that very first year you put it up on a mountain bike forum. And, of course, people listening today are like, what? You know, and I remember on a previous episode talking with Tinker Juarez about how did you find races? And he's like, we went to the bike shop and looked on the wall. So you you put the race on a mountain bike forum. You get 60 people to show up that first time. That is incredible. Where did growth go from there? And how did you go from that to – you know, you're regularly getting pros now showing up. It, you do have a, a prize purse, equal payout for both male and female. What what does the growth of the race look like? And I guess then the real big question is when do guys like Kelly McGelkey and Tinker Juarez get involved? Yeah. Dude, our, our first year, like I can't stress enough how we had no idea what we were doing. Um, <laughs> you know, like I just – I just put it out there. I think we threw together just like a very simple website. I think Chad Zemendorf helped me put that website together. And, and I think, uh, we just like, just like, it was so, so bare bones. And I wasn't even the one to put it on a forum. I wasn't on mountain bike forums. Like it was like all of a sudden some, someone posted it on a forum. I was blown away when 60 people showed up. In 2012, yeah. it was like, it was like, I was, dude, I was stunned. I was, I was so excited. Um, and then 2013, the next year it doubled, we had 120 and then it was, and then the next year after that, it doubled again. And now the race has plateaued around like 450. We've had, we've had, you know, bigger years, smaller years. Um, but it's like people are, are coming to race and, um, you know, it was uh, Kelly McGelkey, um couldn't make it to the first year, the inaugural year, but he came out for the second year. Um, and then there was two other pro level mountain bikers out there that year, and I am I, I don't remember their name, and that and that goes to show also the type of race director that I am. Um, I don't I don't follow professional cycling at all. Zero. I don't watch the Tour de France. I don't know professional mountain bikers' names. I got into this purely because I wanted to share exploration and adventure by bike. And yeah. that is, you know, like I when I, I love watching your podcast because I meet someone new every time. I'm like, who, I don't know who any of these people are, but uh, I love hearing their stories. And, yeah. um, and but I, you know, I've been to like the Lutzen 99er and I'm talking to the to the race director uh, Peter out there and it's like we're, we're sitting there talking and I'm just in awe at how how relaxed he is on race day and I'm there to, to to ride and he's just like he's just sitting there like this and there's people 
doing things all around and he's having a talk with me and then he goes hold on i gotta I got talk to this guy he's you know he came from so far away and you know he's a he's a really good racer and i'm like yeah take your time and uh you know like i i would i just wouldn't recognize a pro if they showed up at the mod 100 um because i don't follow it and so yeah. you know i only knew kelly mcgelke because i met him at race to sunset and he's he's such an approachable guy um, and, and then he just became someone I looked up to. He's from North Dakota. And so he was excited about, you know, when he heard that we were, we wanted to put on the mod, Hey, 100, you know, from the very start, he told me he wanted to come out and, and race it. And so then we, Kelly shows up in 2013. He didn't have the best day. I think he took third that year. Um, and then 2014 is when he came back. Whew. I want to say 14 is when he went sub nine it was either 14 or 15. Um, and he said, you know, I, I think you can go under nine hours on the mod. Hey, 100. And, you know, even, um, even people that had, you know, like people in the local area in Medora wasn't sure that was possible. Um, and he did it and it was so awesome to watch him do it. And then, um, you know, the the race became kind of uh, a chance for me to enter more into the mountain bike world and the racing scene. And it gave me an opportunity to, I wanted to go and see, experience other races because I was, I was a mountain bike racer, um, not on a pro level, but I just loved exploring new places. And one of those places I got to go to was um, uh, the Margie Jessic. And it was, um, I think it was 2016 when I went out to the Marty Jessica and I reached out to the race director, Todd Porquet. And I said, Hey, would you, what I started doing was I would just reach out to these races and say to the race director and say, you want to swap registrations? Like, and, uh, and that was working really well. Like Dakota five Oh, um, uh, Lucha 99 or, um, yeah. The uh, Tatanka 100, man, that was an awesome race. Uh, Kevin yeah. Forster, you know, I started going. I just started just like, you want to swap registrations? Um, because, dude, I've always felt like I've just, I've always felt like I've just been on a budget, right? Like I started on a Walmart mountain bike, and then it was like I was a, I, I was a youth pastor, and then um, it was just like I always just, it was always just kind of this wheeling and dealing, right? Like, like big dreams and small budget, and um, and and so. Uh, swapped registrations with Todd Porquette and, um, and he still hasn't come out and ridden the Mata Hay 100. So <laughs> he loves to do call outs. If Todd Porquette or anyone who knows Todd listens to this podcast, I'm still calling you out, Todd. Uh, you still need to come ride the Mata Hay 100 sometime. Um, but I went out there and then it was, I think the next year after that, um, Tinker rode the Margie, uh, and then I remembered like talking to, uh, you know, Kelly had talked about the idea of inviting Tinker to the Mata Hay 100. And I reached back out to Todd and I just asked him like, what did it take to get Tinker uh, to your race? I was like, do you think he would ever come out to the Mata Hay? And Todd, you know, such a nice guy. He was just like, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, s send him an email. And uh, I talked to Kelly about it. And I think we, s Kelly worked on him. And then I think maybe uh, he planted the seed, and and maybe I included Kelly in the in the email invite to Tinker, and um, and Tinker, you know, he agreed to come out, and so it was uh, it was awesome. And, and Tinker, you know, Kelly is a pro mountain biker and a really good pro mountain biker, um, but he was always had that hometown feel. And he yeah. was so, you know, like so excited to come do the Matahe and promote the Matahe um, and so um, self-sufficient. And even, you know, back at Race to Sunset in Bismarck, it was always like Kelly showed up with like, hit, Team Kelly shows up with like a camper, right? And they're like, and we're going around this four mile loop and it's like Kelly has the most support, uh, more support than everyone else combined. Um, and then he comes out to Mata Hay 100 and his support crew is just like on point. Like they've got it figured out. Whereas Tanker is the first guy that we in, invited to the race and he's a pro mountain biker and he's a two time Olympian and he's a legend. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, 
I'm so like, I don't know what's going to be involved in hosting him, right? And catering to him. And yeah. so, you know, he said, fly me out. Um, you guys have prize money. That's good enough for me. I'll, I'll, I'll race. I'll try to, you know, if you don't have to pay me, I'll just, I'll race for the prize money. And, uh, he goes, and, and lodging. And so we said, yeah, we can, we'll make that work. We bring Tinker out. And, uh, dude, he was so, uh, low key, so low maintenance. I pick him up from the airport. There was a, but his flight got delayed. And then, um, that first time out and then I, and then I had conflict where I couldn't get there right away. And so I pull up his flight's been in, I'm thinking he's going to, you know, I'm like, working through like my apology in, in my head. I'm like, he, you know, uh, I should have been here a while ago, dude. I pull up to the airport and he's just sitting there on a bench, just chill. His dreadlocks coming out of his hat. He's got his suitcase and his bike. And I pull up and he's like, Hey, uh, we throw his stuff in the truck and dude, we get in the truck and we just start chit chatting. And, and there was, there's never all the times I've, I've driven tinker from the airport or back to the airport there has never been like that an awkward silence he's just he's just such a cool guy and so fun to talk to and has endless you know mountain biking stories and yes. uh and so you know from the very beginning it was like we brought tinker out and uh and and my father-in-law has always been his seg driver and they've formed a really cool friendship and bond uh they're about the same age <laughs> And, uh, and my father-in-law, you know, he loves, uh, to be involved in the adventure. Right. And, um, and so that's his way to, uh, to like, uh, that's part of his adventure. And I, and I'll always say this too, the Matahe 100 is unique in that, you know, it's just as much an adventure to be on a SAG crew as it is yeah. to be one of the racers, um, and driving those badlands back gravel roads and trying to get to the next checkpoint aid station. Um, that's another thing that makes the Mata A so unique. And my first experience with the trail, trying, you know, getting lost on back roads and trying to meet the SAG crew and all that, that's all. And then the memories that you make as, as a family and as friends, like that's what we want to share with the Mata A 100. And so, um, yeah, Tinker ended up loving it. He wanted to come back the next year. And he's come back every year since. Um, he has a conflict with a different race this year, so he's not going to be at the Mod A Um And I don't know, how, you know, the dude is amazing. I don't know how many years we have left uh, to ride with Tinker. Like, how yeah. how many times are you going to get to to experience being in a race with the legend? But he is coming to the Badlands Gravel Battle um, this year. So if you want a chance to ride with Tinker Juarez, um, you know. I know we're talking about the Mata Hay 100 right now, but the, the Badlands Gravel Battle is every year Memorial Day weekend, and that's a great time to come out and scout those SAG routes and SAG, yeah. SAG roads uh, before you do the Mata Hay 100, which is part of your story, JP. That's where you got pulled into yeah, it is. this whole it thing. Is. It is the greatest lie you ever told me that I could, if I could handle the gravel roads, I could come handle the Mata Hay 100 without a problem. <laughs> <laughs> But I, you did it. Uh, I did. I did. And honestly, it was like a, a life trajectory changing conversation. Um, and I think Lindsay was part of the conversation too. But yeah, I had just won the gravel battle in 2018. And uh, you guys looked at me and you're like, you need to come out here. And I was like, I don't even own a mountain bike. And they were like, well, if you can ride this this well, you can come do the Matahe. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, to see where I'm now almost six years later. It's crazy. Um, and, and I guess that that's a good lead into the next question is why is the, why is the Mata Hay 100 so hard? Um, cause, cause the gravel battle's mm. hard, but it's on a different level of hard than the Mata Hay 100. Yeah. Like, look, man, it's, it's all, it's all relative into, it caters into your strengths and weaknesses as a rider. So, yeah. you know, I'm a lowlander. I go to Leadville and elevation is very challenging to me. Um, and, and so, but I, I'm in the Badlands and I'm at home and that's because I handle heat very, very well. There have been years where I'm, I'm marking the Mata Haven 100 race course and it is, a, it's actually 106 degrees ambient. Like, you know, that's what the, the weather app is saying on my watch. And so, um, you know, 
it's uh, some people handle the heat. Some people struggle in the heat. And then, you know, the thing about the Matahe Trail is that it's, it's, dude, it's over 100 miles of single track trail. Um, we have the one, you know, two mile bypass uh, uh, around the north unit that has some gravel road there. But otherwise, um, it is, it's bad land single track. And it's, uh, it's like, it's like intervals. It's all so punchy. You, you rarely ever are you on a flat plateau up on top. You're either descending really rugged, challenging, um, exposed, uh, switchback single track trail, or you're climbing straight up the next butte. And so it's just, uh, it's relentless. And I think a lot of people head out, um, really hard and then they get to aid station two, which is 50 miles in. And you've got 57 miles left. And if you're tired at aid station two, you're in trouble because that's when the heat of the day really starts to kick in. And it's like that next 30 mile stretch before you get to aid station three at Wanigan Campground is some of the most rugged, toughest section of trail. And that's where we lose a lot of racers. You know, historically, the Mod Hay 100 has a 50% dropout rate. And that, that's the same as Leadville, right? And then you look at record times for Leadville, less than six hours. Record time for the Matahe 100 is over eight hours. And the reason for that, man, is it's the Badlands. It is Badlands, single track trail, point to point. You're in the middle of nowhere. And uh, and if you don't have a good seg crew, uh, if you don't have a good day, it's going to be, it, It's it, you might not make it. Well, and you got to stop and open a gate every like two miles as well, or three miles throughout right. your day. And that that's where I think people underestimate the speed part. Weather aside, sag aside, ruggedness of the trail aside, you're just, you're coming to virtually a stop every so often opening these cattle gates. And, uh, you know, Kelly has gotten into that on, on a podcast with me and there'll be an episode coming out about why the Matahe is so hard, but the, the gates are a big part of it as well so right. what what does it take for a person in your mind as the race director i've asked kelly i've asked tinker i've asked tyler huber uh what does it take to have a successful day out there determination dude sheer determination yeah you know the first time i rode the mod hay in a day i had no idea what i was doing i didn't i didn't know nutrition i didn't know anything and i'm not uh, I'm by far not the world's best mountain biker, but if you want it bad enough, you will, you'll get it. And I think yeah. for me, it was just like, I wanted an answer to the question, do I have what it takes? And, and I've told people that at the starting line of the Mod Haven hundred on different years, you know, depending on the feel of what's going on at the start, it's like, you know, what do I, what do I want to say to these racers these people who have taken their vacation time and taking a chance on the Mod Hay 100. Um, you know, like we do everything that we can possibly do to set people up for success. We, we mow the trail, we go out and mark the trail. Um, you know, it's like our mission to make sure no one gets lost and everyone uh, has a successful race, but like you have to put in the work and you have to want it. You've got to figure out what works for you for nutrition. Um, you've got to do the training plan that works for you, which everybody has to balance that with, with work and life and, and their passion. Um, but the people that put in the work and experience the Monet Trail, dude, the conversations that I get to have with people at the finish line, it is, uh, I, I love it, man. I absolutely love it. Um, people come in and they just say, I'll take take Josh Testato for instance, yeah. one of the one of the record holders. We talked at the finish line, and he he said, "I just don't understand how there's not a thousand people at this race." Yeah, and and he's like, "It's just so good, it's so good." And I think people are scared to take a chance on North Dakota, um, but it's like the ones that come realize how good it is and. I've talked to people that are the guys coming in, you know, just, just, just before the cutoff times and, uh, and coming in and saying, dude, like this was my Misogi. 
right? And it, yeah. a guy at the finish line last year, it's read one of my favorite books, The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. You know, he's like, do you know what a Masogi is? I'm like, yeah, man, like that's, that's <laughs> one of my favorite books. And he's like, this was my Masogi. He goes, two yeah. years ago, I was 60 pounds overweight and diagnosed with cancer. And he goes, I saw this race and I made this race my goal. And I, and I made this my, my Masogi for this year where you take on a challenge that's so hard that you only have a 50% chance of finishing it if everything goes perfectly. And, and he goes, and, and I mean, dude, we're both crying, right? And, yeah. and you've made me cry when you crossed the finish line before. I, you know, your family waiting for you. I don't, that was one of the most touching moments of, of, of all of the races. And it's just like sometimes you just, you have those moments and, um, and it's like people, some people, that should finish don't yeah. and then some people that shouldn't finish do and then i i don't know i i can't explain it other than just thinking you know thinking back to like what david goggins says where like sometimes when you think you're done and you have nothing left to give you're only at 40 percent. and and the yeah. people that can tap into that determination and, and make their body do what their body's telling them they can't do um then they make it. But I also want to say, <laughs> as a responsible race director, you need to make good decisions, right? Yes. We've we've <laughs> yes. had to rescue people on the trail that have pushed too far, that can't handle heat or can't handle the distance, and and we've had some really dangerous uh, situations out on the trail as well. That, and so to maintain my good relationship with the EMS services and the first responders in, in North Dakota, uh, please make responsible decisions. If You have to put in the work, right? You have to yeah. come prepared. Uh, yeah. And you have to be prepared for anything. You, you hinted at it a little bit there. You know, as, as a race director, it, it is a logistically difficult race to come for, to be prepared for, to get to especially if you're coming in via flight, uh, those kinds of things. But also as the race director, you know, if you're in a two-minute elevator pitch with someone from far away that's thinking about coming to the Matahe, why is all those logistics and all that planning and all that, you know, kind of difficulty to get to Watford City, to get to CCC Campground and do this race, why is it worth it? Why is it worth putting in that time? What What is their experience going to be? that maybe they don't have somewhere else or anywhere else? That's a great question, JP. And, and this is what I would say to that. Theodore Roosevelt was an amazing man. He, he was an, an inspirational figure in history. Um, you know, he, he came out to the Badlands in 1883 and the Badlands have never been the same. And you look at someone who is as accomplished as Teddy and all the things that he did, first president to, to fly in an airplane, his adventures down, read the book, The River of Doubt, his adventures down, uh, down the River of Doubt in the Amazon, all he did in, in politics um, that preserved the, our national parks and, uh, and the reason that we have access to so much um, public land and, and and the chances in our modern times to go out and experience those adventures in so many different places. I mean, the guy did so much. And my favorite quote from Teddy is, he said, if I had to, if I was forced to forget all of my memories, save one, I would choose to remember my time in the North Dakota Badlands. Dude, there is just something so special about the North Dakota Badlands. And I've tried to figure it out and, and crack the code on, on what is it? What is it that's so magical about this place? Um, and, and, and I don't have the answer, but for me, uh, my, my theory is that it's the perfect balance between beauty and, and ruggedness. And it's kind of like this unexpected beauty. It's so people are so surprised to see how beautiful North Dakota is, and then it's like this. It's this arena um, that is so challenging and difficult, and it gives you the opportunity 
uh, to fight for the answer to that question, do I have what it takes? And, I, and that's, that's my pitch, man. That's my pitch. Yeah. If, 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 uh, if Teddy Roosevelt said that it's the only place that, that he would want to remember if he had to forget all his other memories, there's something special about it, and it's worth taking a chance on North Dakota. And the best time to do it is when we have the trail mowed and we have the trail marked and we have volunteers out there at checkpoints and aid stations. It's, it's the safest way to experience the 107 miles of that section of the Matahe Trail. And I think that, uh, I, I think it's one of the best mountain biking experiences that a person can have. And I think there's a, there's a lot of other people who would agree with that. And our pitch is, our marketing scheme is never like, we're the hardest race in America. Yeah. Or we're, you yeah. know, like we're the top, we're the best, best course in the world. You know, like that's not, that's not why we do it. Um, we do it because it changed me and that experience. Um, I'll never be the same. And, and I want to share that with as many people as possible. 100%. One, one more question, Nick. Um, how can people support the work you're doing? Um, whether it's giving or connecting with you to help out with big push, where, what's the best way to find you or to find that information? Yeah, on Facebook, we have uh, Matahe100 uh, as our Facebook page. Um, Matahe is spelled really weird. It's M-A-A-H-D-A-A-H-H-E-Y, 100. So that's the race page. Um, our volunteer uh, work on Facebook, you can find at Save the Matahe. Um, and if, I think if you type in Save the MDH, uh, that'll take you there as well. Our website is savethemdh.com. Um, and you can go on our website and you can shop for some of our apparel, um, help support our efforts that way. Uh, and then you can also make a donation on that page. Uh, if you're not able to come out and be a part of the big push in the middle of July, that doesn't work for your schedule. And you can always you know, send us a little bit of support that way um, financially. Um, but I think that one of the best ways to support what we're doing, um, besides coming out for an event, uh, is, is to come out for the big push because, you know, it's something special to come out and experience the, the race. Um, and it's, and it's a great adventure. Uh, there are certain types of feelings that you can only get, uh, from coming to the big push. When you go out yeah. there with a brush mower, a string trimmer, and, and you, uh, you take away from some of your, what would be your typical training plan um, for prepping for the mountain bike race. Um, and you come out and, and you decide to put some energy into a string trimmer or dig in some dirt, pushing a brush mower. And then you turn around and you see what the trail looks like after you've done that. What, when you know what it looked like before. People that come to the race, they only see what it looked like afterwards. And it's amazing. But when you see how far gone it was before we started working and you, and when you know you had a part in making, um, that a, a part of the world better like that, it's, uh, it's just one of those, man, it makes your heart swell. Like you just, and then the camaraderie that you have with the other volunteers that are out there, you get to be out there with uncle Phil, uh, you get to be out there with the, with the guys that are the guys and gals that are fighting. Um, to make sure that the Matahe Trail doesn't go extinct. And it's like, yeah. man, the, the time um, out on the trail together and then the time back at the campground together, it's something very special. So we always do the big push in the middle of July. So we always start the first weekend after the 4th of July, and then we do two weekends in one week, 10 days. Um, and then the way that you can come out for uh, the big push, we just we just don't do – um, sign ups because sometimes people say they're going to come out and then they don't. So we just always say, like, just look on our Facebook page. We'll tell you where we're starting. And then if you want to meet us that day, just show up at sunrise, uh, where we're starting. And then we post every night how far we got, where we're starting the next morning. Um, and you just, just come out and join us. And, uh, 
that's uh that's how we do the big push so um badlandsraces.com uh save the mdh.com and then we're on instagram as well our instagram is uh modahay 100 awesome nick thank you so much for coming on today and thank you so much for the work you're doing and have been doing to just conserve and preserve a just an amazing place that like like we said earlier changes has has changed my life and continues to change my life as well so i so appreciate you just hanging out for this extended time today nick jp thanks for having me man this was fun to talk about uh i don't know what i was so nervous about but uh <laughs> This was uh, this has been really fun. Thanks for the coffee. Thanks for the chat. I love what you're doing with your podcast, and um, I know what's coming next. You're gonna say, uh, "Remember, you are loved." And every time I hear that at the end of your podcast, man, it's just like I uh, I, I absolutely love what you're doing. So keep up the good work, and thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, of course, man. Nicky Barr, everybody. Thanks for listening today. If you want to hear Nick. Tyler Huber and Kelly McGelkey share their stories from making the Matahe film, you should head over to the Stable Cyclist YouTube channel where you can find the newly released behind-the-scenes episode focused on the Matahe documentary. You can, of course, also find the Matahe film in the same place. And finally, you can find me on Instagram at the Stable Cyclist. The Stable Cyclist Podcast is a twice-monthly show focusing on long-form conversations about bikes, mentality, and of course, when the situation is right, we will dive deep into mental health. Episodes always drop on the first and third Friday of each month, but we will also have bonus pods when possible. Have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you so much for listening, and most importantly, remember, you are loved.